A little comment here from Chris. He just says, this is excellent, Mike. Thank you. There are so many benefits to using constraints within your practices. Agreed. Yeah, okay. hopefully, I, hopefully I made that clear. And I, I guess the other thing to suggest is that I'm not coming on this just purely advocating a one size fits all approach and that you should only use a game based approach and only use constraints within your practice, um, which is why I posed some of those questions at the start. You might well coach in a performance environment where, uh, you know, and with the first team where actually it does look a bit different. It looks a bit more drill based. It looks a bit more um, blocked practice because it's very much geared around three points on the weekend or, a, or an outcome. But often in player development um, environments, game related um, constraints based practices are, are perhaps proven to be a bit more effective at learning, helping learning to stick. So no, I'm glad that that's been glad that that's been of use. But please don't take me as just the the only advocate in a games based or constraints based approach. Certainly that I appreciate there's other ways of doing it. Brilliant. Uh, Chris, again, what are some of the constraints you'd use for more defensive principles of play? It's a good question. Um, I guess it, I'd encourage you to just consider different models and, and maybe those three R's as, as we've used it at our club. Um, but you, you could flip some of the things that I've, I've even put on those slides. So you can give additional points for keeping clean sheets and things like that. Um, if you win a game with a clean sheet, it's worth more points if you're playing a tournament, for instance. Um, there's loads of different ways of doing it. And I suppose one thing I probably have to admit is that I'm unable, really, if I'm honest, to sit here and say, I can just come up with all of the constraints um, because I can't. I, I can be as creative as possible and can come up with some, but, and this isn't me dodging the question, but equally recognise that you guys can come up with some. And I suppose I'd go a step further and say, the players are pretty good at it as well, especially youngsters. Um, and if you embark on this journey, if you're not already on it, of using constraints with the players, they'll be pretty good at it. So question could be, how can we reward the team that defends really well? If you pose that question to a group of young players, they'll answer it in a more creative way than we can. So yeah, Chris, that's not me dodging the question, but I guess just urging everybody to be creative with that um, and, and equally use the, use the athletes, especially young players to help us. Brilliant. Uh, from Kenneth, great way to use constraints on an individual level to challenge players who are far ahead in their development instead of just moving them up to older teams. So just an observational comment, yeah. No, it's good. I think, I guess, the, another point to make on that is that often traditionally as coaches or coaching has just, it's been one size fits all. So we put all the players through the same activity, regardless of whether they're really good at it or let's, let's be frank, really crap at it. And we put them through the same activity. But really, we need to recognise them and we are recognising now that we can put the players in the same activity, yes, but they can have different activities within the activities that can support their support their development. And that will vary from session to session. So we could put a session on, on crossing and finishing. I've used that as an example a lot. I might have Trent Alexander-Arnold in my session, who's amazing at crossing. That's great. Um, I'll have to challenge him. But then equally on the other team, you've got Mike Gillum, who can't cross the ball to save his life. So how do I actually help Mike in the same session as, as Trent? But then next week, we might get into a session about defending crosses using heading I just made that up because I don't know if Trent Alexander-Arnold's any good at that um, compared to maybe you know um, a big centre-back or something so in the in the defending crosses session I might have to treat Trent Alexander-Arnold a little bit differently made up example but yeah it's this concept that players will be at different stages of their learning and that will vary from topic to topic and session to session but it's on us as coaches to support every player in the session not just um and not just adopt a one-size-fits-all approach. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Jason, with a question. If you were training multiple weekly sessions uh, with the same group, would you always use a games-based approach for every contact, or would it fit into a weekly model alongside blocked learning and individual practices, for example? It's a good question. Um, I, I guess uh, I can probably talk to you quite openly about the model that we adopt at Fulham. Um, I've got no issues sharing that. The, the reason I can share that is because it's a model where we are fortunate enough to get the players in really regularly. So if I take the foundation phase players that I've worked with for a number of years, we have them in on a Monday night, a Wednesday night, a Saturday morning, and then games on a Sunday. So we get loads of time with them. And I know that, and I've worked in grassroots environment where that's not always the case. Because we have that, that time, and, and obviously the question is about if you have you know, additional time, because we have that time, 
not every moment with the players is them in a games-based, constraints-based like practice. No, we recognise that there's a, a need for perhaps other things. So we spend some time with them in the classroom um, and we spend some time with them off the pitch. In that sense, we spend some time with them in the gym, I guess, first and foremost. And we're fortunate we've got, we've got those facilities and we can do that. We do also spend some time in, uh, so we spend some time in what's called IDP, like individual development time. And the players will, within the IDP, that will be linked to their, their targets and what they want to get better at. They'll get divvied up into some groups. And you might have some players that actually want to get better at, let's say, striking the ball. Um, and they want to get better at striking the ball. One of the best ways to teach that is probably in a blocked or constant drill-based practice where, to be honest, they just strike the ball over and over and over again. However, when that occurs in our environment, that will occur for like a 30-minute block because we recognise that the players will enjoy it for a bit, but then they'll get pretty bored of it pretty quickly, as probably will we as a coach. And it's probably got some limitations as to how far we can take it in, in, a, in a practice. And um, we're also fortunate that we'll have the players in for a couple of hours of a session. So we can spend 30 minutes or so doing a block practice on striking the ball. And then often what we'll do, what we'll do on every session is we'll spend 90 minutes as a team in our normal, like traditional coaching sessions, if you like. And those will be often utilising a games-based uh, pedagogical approach with, with a lot of constraints. So, so yeah, to answer the question, we do get we do get the time to do other things. So therefore we take advantage of it. Um, some of that's on the pitch, off it. Um, but we will, you would still see const- um, very much like, I guess, um, blocked or drill-based activity in our environment but it's in the minority rather than the majority for sure. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Jason. Good question. Uh, Chris again. So just replying to Kenneth. So that's a good point. Kenneth, I remember putting a constraint on a particular player who was one of the strongest players ability wise and character wise within the group that if he scored, it counted as three goals. So what you'd find is that the opposition would try and problem solve different ways and prevent that player from scoring by man marking and doubling up. Yeah. So it affects the opposition as well. Yeah, good point, Chris. So it's an interesting concept that that in academia they call implicit versus explicit learning. So you can have, as a coach, you can have um, the outcome in your mind. So again, in, in that example, your outcome is to to support the, the that particular individual to score more goals. He's worth three. So that's explicit. That's what's happening. But implicitly, what's happening that you haven't maybe foreseen is that it actually affects the defenders. Um, it's also called co-emergent learning, which I think I mentioned in the slides um, without quote in too much academia. But sometimes you can, and I don't want to go too deep with this, but sometimes you can use constraints to actually get the other thing to happen. So I know there was a question earlier about how do I constrain my defenders or support my defenders? Well, actually, you can just say that um, goals are worth three. Every goal is worth three. Um, and all of a sudden you'll find that the defending gets a darn sight better just because you've said the goals are worth three. So there's this concept of like flipping constraints so that you get that unintended outcome. It's a bit, it's a bit deeper and a bit more complicated and requires a bit more thought as a, as a planning exercise. Um, but yeah, utilizing some of that academia and implicit and explicit and co-emergent learning means that we can actually help the athletes in really clever ways. Players might think, oh, he just wants us to score loads of goals, like decent, that's fine. Actually what you want is to get them to defend properly or at least maybe defend with some more motivation. Um, so again, it's an, it's a really interesting concept, and I'm glad that through that through the chat there, you've you've kind of brought that up. It's an interesting thing that I hadn't probably unintended outcome that I didn't think would come from this for sure. That's brilliant, and I suppose you could have that happen on the attacking side of things as well. If you you know change the defensive constraint, would it have an effect on the attacking side of things? Yeah, definitely, definitely. You can you can flip it around that way where I suppose. Um, Often you do that. I've played this in sessions where, you know, where you might have three teams and two teams are playing and one team's either on the outside or they're off or whatever. Um, and you say that if you concede, you're off. You know that one, like if you let a goal in, get off, you know. Yeah. Um, that can often, you often get better defending, don't you? Because they suddenly don't want to be off the pitch anymore. They want to remain on it. Um, or you get better attacking because they want to score and knock the opposition out. So by, uh, by utilising those constraints, you can be really clever um, and very, and I guess it's a, it's a point to actually emphasise, to be purposeful with this um, and not just to do it because you've attended a webinar and some bloke sat on the front and told you that constraints was a good idea. Um, 
And actually, I think my players will find it fun. So I'll just give it a go. Like That'd be a good reason to start with. But how much better would it be if you're really purposeful about it and it links to the curriculum of work that you were trying to achieve or whatever you were trying to help the players get better at? So definitely don't just use constraints for constraints sake, but be really purposeful about it and really clever with it. And, and more creative than I probably ever have been, for sure. Just on creativity, you were talking about how sometimes when you give ownership to the players, they can actually come up with more creative or out-the-box kind of solutions than what we could have as coaches. So what are some examples that you found? Um, I think you touched on it in the presentation a little bit, but some um, ideas that the players have fed back to you that you thought, actually, I never thought of that. Definitely, they'll come up with they'll definitely come up with additional constraints, as I think I mentioned earlier, that you wouldn't have thought of. Um, but I think what you often find is that players have different solutions to problems on the pitch that you probably just haven't seen. Um, and I guess it's that famous one where you could be on the outside and you could shout to the player pass, and then you find that they dribble when they beat five players and score, and you just look a bit silly because you told them to pass. Um, often by adopting a, a games based and by utilizing constraints within the game by utilizing that as an approach you'll find that players are more empowered and it gives them more affordances to be more creative and just problem solve um, on their own. And there's some stuff that the links to that around learning and how, how players learn via experiential learning and just going and having a go and finding their own way. Um, because let's face it, if I put a scenario up on the screen now and it was like one player on the ball, five players defending and he had a couple of teammates we would all come up with, I don't know how many on the call, 22. We'd all come up with 22 different ways of solving that problem, I'm sure. Um, and it's exactly the same concept with players. You know, you might think in your head that there's one way to solve the problem, but they'll come up with something completely different. Um, so you'll see their creativity and their output on the pitch, for sure. But equally, you can see their creativity and the types of constraints that, that they might come up with if you ask them for their input into that, for sure. Yeah. And with, with a given constraint, say you've, you've um, designed something and you've seen it's getting the outcomes that you want, would you, I mean, how, how often would you repeat that? Or would you look to break it up and kind of disrupt it in a, in a way to further the learning? Yeah, I think if, if they start to find it quite easy, um, then you can perhaps make it harder by placing additional constraints on it or just by changing it completely. And there's something in this around knowing your players um, to know where to pitch things you'll probably find that individual players find things easier than others as i kind of alluded to earlier so you might need to go down a route of challenging individuals or helping individuals on an individual basis um but in terms of like adopting constraints across let's say a number of weeks whatever i've definitely recycled the same constraint and the same type of session with the players i think there is something in it around giving the players an appropriate amount of time to really have a proper go yeah. it's a bit like when children are at school and the teacher says it's playtime, but they only get a certain amount of playtime and then they're just getting into it and they're just having fun or they've just made up a great game in the playground. And then the teacher says, right, bell's gone. We've got to come in now. We're going to do something that's perhaps not as fun as what you were doing. So if you create a nice environment that's very play-based, game-based, you've got to let the players have, a, have an opportunity at having a go. And if that means that you carry it over, I've done that as well, certainly with players at Fulham where, we have reached the end of training because we have got homes to go to and whatever parents are here to pick the players up. But I've then said, don't worry. We, when we come back in on Wednesday, we're just going to start here. So you don't even got to worry or, you know, you need to remember that your team's two new up at this point, but we're coming back in on Wednesday and we're just going to carry on. Um, there's definitely something in that around giving players opportunity. I do find that as coaches, we generally speaking can be quite guilty of wanting to move from one activity to the other pretty quickly. And, Monday nights passing and then Wednesday nights dribbling or whatever. Um, and I, I question how that helps the players get their learning to stick. I must say there is a, there is a ceiling to that where you just do, I'm not advocating doing the same thing every session because the players will just get bored and, and think that you haven't got anything else in your locker. Um, but there's certainly a bit about letting the players have appropriate time to adapt and, and, and adjust to the type of problem that you've, you've posed in front of them by the constraint. Yeah. Definitely with that. Guys, uh, if you've got any other questions or comments, leave them in the chat or we'll start to move this towards the end now. Um, just on performance uh, environments, Mike. So obviously we've spoken mostly about the development phase and how constraints can work in, in that. But in regards to a performance environment, how might 
we practically use some constraints to still develop the players, but also obviously keep in mind of the need for results and performance? I think I think you still can, actually. Um, I think often in performance environments, what you tend to find is that it's very much about managing the athlete's load. Um, because, again, if I take like our first team at our club, we have games very, very regularly. We're playing in the Premier League and at the moment, and those games are thick and fast. And it's very much about um, ensuring our athletes can recover from the game, factoring in travel, etc. So when we place them in a games-based session, we know that that has a significantly higher level of load on the players. So we have to manage that. Um, but we still can use constraints to support the players prepare for a game. You just got to be clever and more sports scientist, sports scientific, I guess, about how and when you do that. And I guess that's why you have a proliferation of roles in sports science in performance environments compared to, you know, the under 10s. So you would do it. You could still use constraints if we were to use Fulham, for instance, um, and they're playing Man City coming up. You might challenge one team or constrain one team that, however many passes you put together equals the amount of goals. So in other words, you're saying, I just want you to pop the ball around like we expect Man City to do. Um, and then you can obviously coach the other team to respond to that. Um, you could equally say that one team is one nil down in the game, which might encourage them to just drop a little bit because that's actually what you want your team to do when they face Man City. So you can still use constraints in a performance environment, but often you've just got to consider the time that you have with the athletes in terms of, balance in recovery and another and other things that they'll undoubtedly need to do and it's about yes recovery but then also um i guess building them back up again ready so you'll often see different types of practices that are just like passing and moving the ball rondos etc that i guess keep the players tuned in and keep them sharp and give them ball contact um but you just have to manage when you adopt that type of approach and, and i guess how um and often you want to you often see those coaches go in and coach in a more explicit way, like stand, you know, stop, stand here now, because we reckon that De Bruyne is going to stand there on, on Saturday or whatever, and therefore you need to be there, otherwise we're going to lose. Whereas in a in a longer term player development sort of environment, you maybe don't have to be as explicit as that and you can afford them a bit more time. Brilliant. Yep, makes sense. All right. So last comment from me. Um just wanted you to expand if you could again on the 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 Ben Bartlett model that you shared with us the restrict the relate and the reward because I think that's got really good um obviously it rolls off the tongue but it's uh, yeah. something that you can um, really quickly get going in your environment so if you could just kind of give us like some a summary of it again that would be really helpful I think no definitely it's um and I can't take credit for it at all um because it isn't my work, but I just find it an interesting, an interesting way of considering it because you've got R's, which is obviously it's an easy way to remember things, but equally um, it's a, it's just a framework by which to go off of. And I suppose if Ben was here and I know Ben really well, it's not, he's not advocating that that's the only way to consider things. It's just a way to consider um, what I'll do. And again, just without dodging the question, I'm conscious it's not my work. I'm just going to, if it's all right, I'll post a link in the chat to an article that Ben's done um, purely about his um, about his model. Um, and it's just a bit more, I guess it's extra reading, if you like, but it's probably easier that we all just engage with that in our own way and perhaps get a bit more detail on, on the model. Um, and again, just challenge every coach as you, as you would to, to consider their own, their own way of, of developing constraints, whether that's to utilise the the athletes and to, to obviously ask them to come up with some on, on your behalf or whether it's just purely by your own creativity. But no, I've, I've popped the link in, in the chat there, which hopefully help answer the question. Brilliant. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, okay, final one then. Um, Chris, you get it. So Thomas Deschel used the constraint of holding tennis balls to prevent his players from pulling on jerseys rather than just telling them to stop pulling their jerseys. Yeah. Have you, have you come across that, Mike? I haven't actually, and it got quite famous, didn't it, in the in the press with Tuchel doing it. I think he's also used a smaller ball, um, size one ball or whatever, in in regards to the session because he felt it had a, a certain type of outcome. So, no, again, good example of perhaps a more perhaps a more innovative coach and maybe more modern thinking coach in in the elite level of the game, and it's good good to see um, because often there maybe is a more traditionalist approach to the way in which we teach, especially in a performance environment. 
um, that we're recognizing and hopefully I illustrated via um, academic research and stuff that there's a perhaps more effective way of doing it for sure. So no, it's a good example that one. I should have thought of that myself, but no, it's a good example to, to finish on, I think for sure. Brilliant. All right, guys, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for making time in your day to, to join us and for your questions that really added to uh, the, the, the event. And Mike, of course, thank you so much for your, for your time, for your, uh, for your insights and your, your detailed answers as well. I'll just leave the final words with you. No, thank, thank you. Thank you to, to obviously Coaches Club Academy for inviting me on. Um, thanks to all of you for engaging. Hopefully it's been useful. Um, and as I say, I think I put my contact details on any of the slides, but if not, Uptash, I can pass them on to you. Like if anybody wants to get in touch um, or, or has any additional questions that might arise after this, then feel free to get in touch. But no, many thanks and enjoy the rest of your, your evenings.